So hello everyone, this is Lauren Flores. This is 5 and 25 Essential News Vocabulary. Today I am joined by my colleagues, Manatee and Jordan. Also we'll be joined by Daniel in a little bit and we're gonna talk about several different terms in the news. There's actually five of them. So let me pull up the screen so you can see what they are. So first we're gonna define intersectionality. Then we're gonna talk about the Denning-Kruger effect. Then we'll move to thirst trap. The next term after that will be sea lioning. And then our very last term is going to be sock puppet. So I'm really excited to have my colleagues here. They're awesome presenters. I have a lot of great insight on these particular terms. What I'd like to do is ask everyone to please hold your questions. You can ask questions, of course, through the chat. And my colleague, Lily, who's gonna be the moderator, will assist you with answering those questions. But it would be really helpful if you would wait till the presentation part is done. So that way we can respond to them effectively. So I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Daniel. Intersectionality is the interconnected nature of social categorization, such as race, class, and gender, as they apply to a given individual group regarding as creating overlapping and independent, interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. So I think what they're trying to say is that it's about how you self-identify, what, um, what groups you feel that you are a part of and belong to in a social sense, so what race or ethnicity um, do you belong to. Um, we're doing that right now with the census, where you, they're asking you to declare uh, race and ethnicity in a variety of ways. Some of them are kind of check mark boxes, sometimes they give you the option of writing in other where you can um, explain on your own, in your own words. Um, class, are you aligning yourself with middle class, upper class, upper middle class, lower class, an impoverished class, a ru a ruling maybe um, affluent class. Gender, how do you categorize yourself? When you get into the next part of, that, of who you're talking to and where that fits into a larger community, relationships, or society, if we move it to something that's a little less uh, complex and you say, I wanna just align myself with an affluent class I am upper class, I'm not upper middle, I am from the most affluent, economically affluent class in the country. Is everyone gonna agree with you? Are they gonna abide by your benchmarks for that? Um, they're constantly, you know, advertisements, or not advertisements, they're constantly articles about, does a million dollars make you an affluent person? Does a hundred million dollars make you an affluent person? They're constantly talking about billionaires. Being a billionaire and a person with one million dollars is a pretty substantial difference. So then what does that imply about would the billionaires recognize you as part of their class? <clears throat> so you can expand that to ethnicities and gender and people then feel like it's their place to just assess you from their own perspective, from their own definition of authenticity, right? Are you, whatever that label is by their definition, and if you're not, then they feel like then they can recategorize you and treat you in the way that they categorize you. So once you get to the part of the interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage, you're talking about relationships and relationships with power. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to turn it over to Jordan. He's going to introduce the Denning-Kruger effect. Good evening, good evening. Um, so my name is Jordan Torres. Uh, my segment of the five and 25 is the Dunning-Kruger effect. And as you can see, the image right there of uh, Archer Sterling from the show Archer, he is probably the best person I would 
I would think to, to sum up the idea of the Dunning Kruger effect. If you haven't seen the show, uh, watch it and then kind of think about this term as you watch it. So the Dunning Kruger effect uh, was a study conducted in 1999. The effect describes a phenom phenomenon where individuals of low competence in a task or subject matter suffer a double burden in their perceived competence. The first burden being they overestimate their competency in relation to their peers, and the second being they are unable to recognize their own incompetence. Due to their lack of skill or knowledge, they are left to rely on competence to assess their ability, which in turn is an unreliable source since they do not have the skill or knowledge which would be necessary to assess their ability or their peers' ability. It is a paradox resolved by making the individual more competent in the task or subject matter. So basically to boil it down, um, a person comes in on a topic, they don't really have too much skill or knowledge about it. And when they first start off, they're gonna they're gonna perceive themselves as being really good at it because they don't have any idea of what it really takes to assess their own skill. And and because of that they end up having like an above average effect. They're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm better than most average people at this. But in reality, they're not. And then secondly, they can't realize that because they don't have the skill or knowledge to assess it. They say that the, the skills and, and knowledge necessary to do it engen uh, engender also the idea of assessing it. So now they're, they're completely blind to the idea that they're actually not even good at what they're doing. Um, and from what they found in the study as well is that the only way to make someone see that they're not uh, competent is by giving them competency to teach them to give them the skills um, so basically with the first uh, graph the first uh, graph here the dunning kruger effect uh, the top one competence it, it's it's a scale between confidence and competency so basically at the beginning when you have very little competence you rely mainly on competence to get you by um to to assess but that doesn't mean you're really good at any of it so as you gain knowledge or the skills necessary to do the task you become part of the average and then you start getting less competent because now you're realizing oh i'm not as good as i thought i was and then as you gain into the spirit to the expert realm, you start gaining confidence, but now it's true confidence in the idea that you understand that. So that's the, the Dunning-Kruger effect when you're looking at the idea of uh, confidence and competence. The original study um, wasn't really looking at confidence, I guess per se, more of the perception of what they believe that they're in, and that would be the idea of competence in that case. But from their study, um, they had them do a logical reasoning test in this portion, and they asked them basically out of, I think it was 10 questions, how many do you think you got right? And then how well do you think that you did amongst your peers? So the bottom quartile and their real actual score, they scored very low, but they thought that they had had more correct answers than, they, than what they really did. And then also their perceived ability amongst their peers was another thing that was very high as well. So that's where you can start seeing the Dunning-Kruger effect to, uh, occur because they perceive themselves as competent when they're really incompetent. And as the scores go up, it's still the same until you get to the top quartile where their actual score is very high, but their perception is very low of it. And the reason why being that is what they call it the false consensus. Since they're judging themselves amongst their peers, they uh, believe that they're gonna they are just as average as them. Until they see until they see the, the scores of their peers, then that's when it readjusts and their perception matches the actual reality and it's a higher score. So that's basically the Dunning Kruger effect. Um, some memes that people you can find like real knowledge is to know the extent of one's ignorance. So to, to beat the Dunning-Kruger effect, you have to know your own ignorance, but it's kind of funny that you, it's just that paradox. Um, 
the idea that you're smarter than the average person. I'm smarter than you all. At least that's what I think, the perception. Um, and then here's a list of overconfident staff who always promise more than they can deliver. Great. Put them in sales. So their confidence probably gets them more in the sales than their actual knowledge of it. So. And then here's some references that uh, refer to the original study of the Dunning-Kruger. And then another one um, that I didn't get to talk about too much, but it's the political knowledge one. And that's kind of what, in this time period, you probably want to look at the Dunning-Kruger effect in, in, in relation to uh, political knowledge. And that's pretty much it. That's the uh, Dunning-Kruger effect. That is awesome. Thank you so much, Jordan. That explains it perfectly. So I'd like to go ahead and transition. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Manatee. They're going to talk about thirst traps. Hello, I'm here to, to talk to you about thirst traps. Here's an example of a thirst trap. Uh, so what is a thirst trap? It's a part of in it's Instagram and selfie culture. And uh, it means when you share a picture and it, that's supposed to um, entice people. So the word has been around long enough to merit a fledgling entry in the online Merriam-Webster's dictionary. According to Merriam-Webster's, a thirst trap is often a photo used to entice a response, usually in the form of praise, compliments, or more explicit expressions of ardent desire. In other words, a thirst trap is a selfie or photo, usually on Instagram or other social media, meant to be sexy. And the phrase thirst trap has been around since at least 2011, when it first started appearing on dictionary.com. Now the word has evolved. Uh, thirst trap can now refer to that sexy picture or it re can refer to the person in the picture. For example, actors, actor Chris, Chris Hemsworth and politician Justin Trudeau have been referred to as thirst traps. So here is a, th recently Martha Stewart made the news when she published a selfie that was regarded as a thirst trap. Also, um, soldiers, both men and women, have been noted for posting thirst trap videos recently on TikTok. Um, this word can also be used as a verb. For example, in the article about people in the armed forces posting provocative videos and photos, the reporter mentions and while the women seem to take the most heat for sharing provocative content, there is certainly no shortage of male service thirst trapping. So there it is being used as a verb. Um, and it's, it's changed. The word has evolved since it first came out in 2011. According to Urban Dictionary, uh, thirst trap used to mean just any statement used to intentionally create attention or thirst, but now it refers just to the picture. Um, and these pictures are usually posted to feed the ego or draw public attention, but sometimes they're posted to get the attention of a particular person, and that's slightly different. That's uh, perhaps someone you have a crush on or someone who has rejected the, the subject of the picture. And if this is the case, according to Wikipedia, there's a new term, and that term is Gatsbying. Uh, derived from the great Gatsby. It sh means showing beautiful pictures of your party or your activities on social media in order to get the attention of a particular person. It's considered a highbrow version of thirst trapping. So that's thirst trapping. Awesome. Thank you so much, Manady. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to mine. So let me get my screen ready. So that way we can see what I have. So the one that I have assigned today that I'm going to talk about is sea lioning. And that is a picture <laughs> of a sea lion. <laughs> so it actually is another one of those internet terms. It's meant to describe a way that you can harass or troll people. It actually has its origin in a internet comic. So this is the actual comment comic itself. It's Wonder Mark by David Malky. And so you will see that it's in the Victorian style, but it does feature a sea lion that is asking incessant questions. And so I've heard sea lioning 
described as a type of human denial of service attack. So if you're familiar with that, it's basically when you hit a server constantly and it causes it to crash. So the human person that's doing the sea lining is, will be asking you tons and tons of questions. They are usually really simplistic. They may be questions that don't have a lot of merit to them. They're constantly repetitive. They may try to pick apart your your argument and pick these really tiny points and focus on those intensely. And so basically the way it works is they just try to wear you down with all these questions. And so you can see that, of course, illustrated in this particular comic. But if you go to Urban Dictionary, there is a pretty good explanation here. And they do talk about um, how a lot of times the folks that are doing the sea lining they will have a, a guise of being very civil. And so when you finally do start to lose your temper because they're bombarding you with questions, then they'll turn it around on the victim and say things like, you know, why are you so upset? I'm, I'm asking you a perfectly solid question and I'm doing it in a really nice way. And so it's just a way that the person that's doing the sea lining is trying to manipulate you into getting angry and just stopping your your line of argument. And so I also think it's interesting because they do mention, and I'm probably saying this wrong, it's Latin, it's ad uh, nauseum. So there is actually a classical Latin term for this type of harassment. It's been, a, it's been with us for a long, long time. So um, again, as Manatee mentioned, if you have any questions, I think sea lining is pretty cut and dried. You may go back, you may go online today and have a look and see if you can find any sort of examples. It may have happened to you before in different settings, in school, at work, and other places. But it's a good thing to know because when you are online, people will use certain tactics to try to derail a conversation or try to seize control of the narrative and turn it to their own ends. And with that being said, I'm going to transition to the next term, or the last term rather, which is sock puppets. And this is a really interesting internet phenomenon. It is basically, and I'll actually show you a really quick picture, and I'm moving around here, but um, if you watch Casa de las Flores, it's a novella on Netflix. This is Chui, the sock puppet. And I did pick this image because you will see that, you know, it is a puppet, but you see the person behind it. And generally with a sock puppet, it is an internet account that has a bad actor sometimes behind it. And I mean that in the sense of somebody who is creating an internet profile or personality and they're using it to manipulate the narrative around a certain topic. Sometimes they're using this particular account to spread misinformation or disinformation. You may have seen when you go to a site like Yelp where there are a lot of different reviews Sometimes people will create sock puppet accounts so that way they can bolster either a place or an item or a type of good and leave reviews on it. So it's generally the person that either owns or works for the place or posing as somebody else. So that way they can make their rating go higher. That's one way that it's used. If you go to this particular image right here, which is a guide, uh, sock puppets are really similar to bots and sometimes it's really hard to tell them apart. They're both generally created to deceive, inflame, and influence opinions. And so if you look at the characteristics of sock puppets, they are false accounts that are controlled by humans. So that makes it different from, say, a bot, which is usually an automated program that's behind that particular internet account. Um, with sock puppets, they are meant to manipulate online discussion and they um, often emulate grassroots supporters. And actually my colleague uh, Vanity has mentioned that there's actually a word for fake grassroots people. And actually I'm looking that up right now, but if you happen to remember it off the top of your head, Vanity? Yes, it's astroturfing. Thank you so much. So astroturfing, which is a really interesting way to put that particular concept. But the other thing about sock puppets, and I think I mentioned this already, is that they are used to write fake reviews or to increase social media account follower numbers. It's interesting, though, because it may be hard sometimes to identify a sock puppet. There's several different ways that 
you can do that. Usually when you're looking at an internet site and you're seeing people talking, you might get a sense that there's something off with that particular person that's talking. Sometimes their syntax may be a little bit off. They may have other characteristics, like if you look at the profile, sometimes with a sock puppet, they may not have very much. They might use a stock photo as their profile picture. Sometimes they'll have these really peculiar descriptions and in their bio part. A lot of times if you are entering a really heated discussion on the internet and you're seeing all these people commenting, if you look at their profiles, another dead giveaway would be if you find a lot of posts from a person that really has just been online or they've only had their account for maybe a month or less. That's another big giveaway. So, um, it's interesting because sock puppetry is used by governments and individuals. So there is, of course, the famous Internet Research Agency that is a government entity from Russia. They are notorious for this type of online activity. So you'll see maybe a lot of sock, pu sock puppet accounts. Let me repeat that. You'll see a lot of sock puppet accounts in different social media sites. You'll see them on Twitter. You may find them on Instagram and Facebook, especially ahead of the election, which is coming up. And it's interesting because here's some characteristics of sock puppets that you can use to be able to identify them more easily. So they do tend to contribute pure quality content. And actually, I meant to say they do meant to contribute poorer quality content. They post on more controversial topics. They spend more time replying and arguing to the posts of others. So you may see them also engaging in sea lining where they ask incessant questions. And they do tend to be a bit more abusive in their interactions with other people. So according to Wiki How, these are some steps that you can take to be able to identify sock puppets. You can start out by comparing IP addresses. This is probably the easiest way that you can do that. You can also watch closely for similar traits, including characteristic misspellings of often used words or phrases. And again, pay attention to their language. If they have some strange syntax, they may say things that don't make a lot of sense. They may use strange idioms. That's another clue. And then, of course, you can always report the suspected sock puppet to the webmaster, or there's usually a mechanism on social media where you can report abusive or just harassing uh, profiles. So you can do that. And then um, there is a really interesting link. I'm going to post it in a second. And I'm pausing here for a second because I'll post that on the bottom. But I wanted to ask, because Manatee contributed quite a bit to the research on this particular topic, and I wanted to see if they wanted to weigh in with some opinions or just some concluding remarks. Let's see. Um, I was just going to say that the U.S. has also um, used uh, sock puppets, and uh, there have been hoaxes created and spread this way. For example, there was a fake explosion in Louisiana according to Wikipedia. And this, the in, information about the explosion was spread on social media by sock puppets. That's so. interesting. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is a problem. And I can see that, especially as we move forward toward the election, that it's probably going to get more and more, I don't want to say worse, but there'll probably be a lot more activity with these types of accounts. So everybody, please keep your eyes peeled. So I'd like to go ahead and wrap up if anybody has any questions. As I mentioned, Lily, our moderator, will be on the chat and text. So you can go ahead and relay questions to her. You can also ask us questions directly. And Lily will let us know if you have any questions so that we can try to answer them.